Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Wednesday, June 5th. This is a watershed moment for Illinois. The governor's officially signed off on the state budget, but will that $40 billion plan wash away Illinois' fiscal pain? Alderman Burke, you plan to resign? In the wake of Alderman Burke's not guilty plea to federal corruption charges, Mayor Lori Lightfoot unveils another round of ethics reforms. We have to pay a lot of people in cash, which can be very challenging. We have to have security, armed security at all times. And in the latest in our marijuana series, we go to Phoenix to hear about the problems legal pot retailers have with trying to use the banking system. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Paris Schutz. It's official just days after the close of the legislative session. Illinois has a 2020 fiscal year state budget. Perhaps the greatest unmitigated success is that we achieved something that has eluded state government for decades. We passed a real balanced budget. Yeah. yeah. Governor J.B. Pritzker signed off on the $40 billion spending plan just this afternoon, but even with both sides echoing the governor's claims of success, can Illinoisans be sure the budget will help fix the state's fiscal woes? Joining us to share their take on the budget are two key lawmakers who helped make it a reality, Illinois Senate President John Cullerton, a Democrat from Chicago, and Illinois House Minority Leader Jim Durkin, a Republican from Western Springs. Welcome both of you back to Chicago tonight. Thank, Thank you very much. President Cullerton, uh, this budget relies on some rosy economic projections. Is it realistic to rely on that to balance the budget? Well, it's like every time you do a budget, you have to rely on what you think is going to come in the next year and we look to our Department of Revenue and they give us the numbers and we make those those uh, decisions based on that but we we added some revenue we took some tough choices and I think as a result we're gonna have a balanced budget and you have to keep in mind we're gonna continue I think one of the most important things continue to fund education in a three and a half billion dollar uh, I'm sorry, three, three and a half, 350 million dollars extra money, third year in a row, over a billion dollars in the last year. That's a big, big improvement. More money for education, more money for the state's troubled DCFS program. Uh, Leader Durkin, mm -hmm. you signed off on the budget. How come th you and a handful of other Republicans are for this uh, when it does spend more money than last year? Well, first and foremost, my commitment to my caucus and also to everyone in Illinois is that uh, our responsibility is to pass a budget that's uh, balanced. This is a balanced budget and more importantly it does not rely upon any new taxes or a tax increase. We had a good year economically and this was a bipartisan agreement that I had with President Cullerton, the governor and the speaker with respect to the budget but also with the infrastructure program. What was important from my perspective is that the Republicans asked for numerous business reforms things that have not reached uh, the, the committees for, for a number example, of years, uh, a data center, data center tax credit. Uh, we were able to phase out the franchise tax. Um, uh, we reinstated the manufacturer's tax credit, uh, a blue collar jobs act, and a list goes on of a n number of things in which for the past two weeks I've stated that these are conditions in which myself and my caucus needs for us to be able to work with um, the Democrat majority on capital and also the budget and I'm glad that the governor and also the Democrat leaders said you know what we can live with this we can work with this. There's, there's bipartisan unity on this uh, Senator Cullerton but your colleague here earlier today called the progressive income tax constitutional amendment quote uh, hand, uh, uh, what, what was the word? Pickpocket. <laughs> pickpocketing. Yeah. Pickpocketing well, the taxpayers. News, the good news there is that that's not going to be uh, our choice anymore. This is a constitutional amendment which is going to be on the ballot. The voters get to decide uh, next year whether they want anybody who makes over three hundred million dollars of uh, three hundred millions I've been coming back from Springfield three uh, three hundred thousand um, dollars if you make over three hundred thousand you'll pay more if you make uh, less than three hundred thousand you'll pay less. What, what he's arguing and Republicans are arguing is you could go back in future years and and raise those rates even more. Yeah the, they're concerned about the rich people getting taxed even higher the middle class is getting a break I understand why they have to resort to some something to say negative about it but if they don't like it all you gotta do is vote no. Is this this fear mongering? No it's reality and uh, we've looked at this we've studied this for a number of years and uh, the governor's constitutional amendment and also the subsequent uh, rates which he signed today to me are just more populist themed uh, uh, messages from his campaign we were able to balance a budget the flat tax has been working and it's evenly spread across the state. When it happens is that when you have the rates so high 
that those people who are paying at those rates eventually <coughs> will leave the state. We've seen that in other places, some states not, but we will see a change in the rates, and that's why I asked in a committee hearing of whether or not the Democrats would allow for these rates to be included in the constitutional question. And they said no. So they're open to fluctuation, and I think that you're not going to see a positive growth at the end of the day. You're going to see a decline in revenues. It means that the rates are going to have to be adjusted for different uh, income brackets. Even though the projections brackets. are for $3 billion or it's more. It's more money because we've, had this, we've been cash-strapped. Uh, this is 34 states have it. The federal government has it. Uh, but again, it's, all we did was put it on the ballot. Folks get to decide. It's not going to go into effect unless 60% uh, of the people vote for it. All right, I, I want to get back to the budget really quickly and read a statement from the ratings agencies. Moody's, they say, quote, the accomplishments of the 2019 legislative session indicate improvement in political willingness. However, pension contribution requirements remain on track to outpace organic revenue growth, which will subject the state to persistent <laughs> fiscal pressure, barring, barring further politically difficult decisions. Uh, Leader Durkin, isn't pension reform going to have to be looked at again at some point? Absolutely. Uh, since the Supreme Court a few years ago threw out Senate Bill 1, which goes back about five years, we have not looked or made any significant gains with pension reform. I would hope that we would put a, you know, a very sincere, earnest effort into reviewing the current status of the, of the court case, looking at it again with a fresh uh, set of eyes, but we have to do something with our public pension systems. I know that the city of Chicago is also looking for some relief. This has to be, this is gonna be a bipartisan uh, operation, but I think we need to dedicate next session towards fixing our public pension systems once and for all. And, and the likeliest proposal was one from your office, Senator Colard, in the consideration model. Is, that, actually, is actually, that coming back? Actually, we passed it. Uh, you pass it, passed, it, out, of it passed out of the Senate. The Senate that didn't get called in the House. Uh, the unions opposed it. Uh, I think we have to go back to them and see if they would take another look at it. Keep in mind, people should know that we did about eight years ago pass a major pension reform. Everybody who's been hired since then has a very minimal pension. Over half the school teachers and state employees now are on that minimum pension. So we have this legacy that we've been paying off for 25 years. We have another 25 years to go, uh, and then we'll have it paid off. It's a lot of money, and that's what people are saying. It's not a crisis. It's not, a, it's not bankrupt. It's just that it's a lot of money. We're having to pay for the past uh, mistakes that we made by, uh, by not putting enough in and by having maybe overly generous pensions. It's certainly a big hump to get over until that, that that's those correct. new and pension. A lot of people do this with their mortgages. They refinance. They so-called kick the can down the road. Those are the things that are on the, on, the, on the table. Okay, so the gaming bill passed at the last minute to Leader Durkin. Six <clears throat> new casinos, more video gambling, sports betting at stadiums. Is there any concern here that Illinois is going down a dark and seedy path? You know what? The whole boogeyman uh, aspect of gaming is over. There's gaming in Illinois, whether it's in a bingo hall, it's in rivers, it's at racetracks. Every state that surrounds us has more competitive gaming operations in which we're losing market share. Uh, we have to be competitive, and uh, this is a way for us to be able to help, you know, with our revenues that we have to rely on every year with our budget. You know, the argument will always be there, but you know what? We had to do it. It's the right way to fund a capital program, which is something that Illinois desperately needed. But I talked to the governor about it. He says this issue has been around too long. Let's deal with the sports book and also the bigger issue of expanding gaming. I supported it, and you know what? People have to make a decision whether or not they want to participate. But when they're leaving the state, crossing the state lines, illegally betting, why don't we keep it here in the Although state? Although revenues for gambling in Illinois have actually gone down in the last several years, is there really demand to fill all these new uh, gambling the, positions? The, po the point is these casinos, these new casinos, uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of gaming, but people do it. Uh, the sports betting is new. People are doing that illegally, just like with marijuana. They're doing it illegally. Why not make it legal and, and regulate it and get some money? With regard to the casinos, uh, we've been paying for Indiana schools with uh, our people going across the, across the state line to Hammond. Uh, now at least they can stay here. Uh, that was one of the reasons why we did it. We also um, actually, as, Bill, as Jim said, we have to have a lot of uh, money for these capital projects, which is another uh, overdue 10-year uh, hiatus of not having these, uh, these investments. Where do you believe is the ideal place for a Chicago casino? Well, I was talking to my son about that earlier this morning. Well, Apparently he wants to go over there. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the idea of having it closer to Indiana uh, where the Indiana uh, Casino is, to me, is uh, up, it's up to the city council, though, and, this, and the gaming board has to approve it. Um, there's been, the governor even said, uh, people go to McCormick Place uh, conventions because they work here. They don't go to 
Disney World and they don't go gaming, they do in Orlando and Vegas. So maybe not so close to uh, McCormick Place would be a good idea. Leader Durkin slipped into this bill as a provision to um, have the gaming board, which is sort of the regulatory body of gaming in Illinois, meet in private and not be subject to uh, open meetings. Why was that put in there? I can't speak to that. Um, and I wasn't aware of that provision until <coughs> earlier today. Things move very quickly, but I hope that we can examine that and we do have rulemaking that we still will be coming from this gaming bill in which we can return to that question. I believe transparency is important. Uh, it may have, may have been an error. I'm not quite certain why it made it into the final product, but I believe that the decisions that are made and discussions should be made public. We have to be transparent in this process. President Collington, do you know why that was put in the final Didn't, uh, the type of thing, when you pass so many massive bills, we do what we call trailer bills. We go back and say, why is this in here? Uh, maybe the drafters put it in intentionally, maybe it was unintentional. Uh, I just learned about that after we, we left this. Are either well. you concerned about some of the, the connections that some of your colleagues have to the gaming industry? Well, that's something we did put in there because we did put legislation in dealing with marijuana. We put legislation also dealing with, with video gaming so that there's any, uh, so that to, to make it clear that the legislators should have no connection financially to those uh, industries since we are now regulating them. Leader Durkin, what is a realistic revenue uh, expectation for the city of Chicago from the casino for the state of Illinois? Look, the sky's the limit on this, and uh, it depends on how good of a product that they put forward. We're still going to be years away before these operations will be full going, but I think the city of Chicago uh, will be a very, very prominent, and it's going to be a very lucrative operation, which will be going, a portion of it will be dedicated towards the Chicago pension funds and I think that's important uh, part of it's gonna go to the state too also, also lucrative is is marijuana legalization recreational marijuana very quickly because we're running out of time why should Illinoisans believe Illinois is ready to regulate and police this industry really the first state to do it uh, by the legislature the rest of them were done by uh, by referendums we did a phenomenal job Senator Staines and Kelly Cassidy did a phenomenal job going around the state uh, checking off all the boxes, New York, New Jersey couldn't do it. Uh, and it, it's something, again, that I'm told, never used it myself, but I'm told a lot of people do. So why not regulate it and make some money on it? All right, President Cullerton, Minority Leader, Jim Durkin, thank you both as thank always you. for being here. Okay, thank you. And up next, Mayor Lightfoot and her new round of ethics proposals. That and more in our weekly edition of Spotlight Politics. Dancing to those tunes, you two over here. <laughs> Mayor Lori Lightfoot is out with a new round of ethics proposals to try and clean up what she says are some of the corruption problems at City Hall. So here's a little bit of what she's proposing. A ban on outside jobs for aldermen that would present a conflict of interest. An inspector general that has more oversight of City Council. Bigger fines for ethics violations and expanded rules for lobbyists. So here to help us wade through these items and analyze what we just heard on the state budget is our spotlight political team of Carol Marine and uh, Amanda Vinicky. Carol Marine, will 26 city council members get on board these new ethics provisions? Uh, they'll get on, I think, most of them. As we've seen with Lori Lightfoot's chairmanships, I mean, she swept that council except for Ed Burke and a couple of his friends. So I, I think until uh, they figure out what's a hill that, as you and I've talked about, is uh, is too high to die not die on. That, well, they'll go along. Right. So for the for the people that oppose Lori Lightfoot and City Council, they might not think that this is the hill to die on. There's going to be other difficult votes. Amanda Vinicky, restricting outside employment, that seems to be aimed squarely at Alderman Ed Burke and his role as a property tax appeals attorney. I think it's aimed at him, but that's a warning to perhaps other aldermen, to those who have been there for a while, to those who may want to become an alderman in the future. There are plenty of people that have second incomes, and this is something that is a tradition in Illinois, in the city of Chicago, in state government. A lot of people have these second incomes for what I, I frankly don't understand how people are able to do. A lot of All times sort of powerful jobs and at the same time be dealing with their ward issues well, and to the be political fair, issues. State it's government, a lot. State 
State government is a part-time job by design. City exactly. government is not a part-time job. And uh, someone who's going to stay in that I job. Think you could argue neither are part-time jobs, but they're used as part-time well. jobs. When you have a pension, you have a very decent salary. But, I mean, that's a choice that the lawmakers have made and legislated around. All right, fair point. Alderman Burke uh, has uh, been called on by the mayor to resign. Doesn't seem like he's going to do that. Can he still cause problem for Mayor Lightfoot uh, with this indictment hanging over him? You know, yes, but less and less. I think he, he, he made his stand on her first day, and it didn't go very well as he tried to reproach her for having uh, not gender-neutral language in some of the, the, the new language that she was proposing. No, I think, he's, I think he is deeply wounded, but he's going to stay there. He is not going to plead guilty. He's not going to resign. He's going to stick around. You don't get to that level unless you're a fighter and right. one that w is willing to throw any political arrows. And clearly, I think, as we saw in that first city council meeting, doesn't particularly care if they don't have a great chance of landing. Speaking of fighting, do you think the other two people caught up in this indictment, Charles Quay, a developer, and Pete Andrews, Burke's um, you know, long-time political aide, are they going to flip against him, do you think? I mean, do the feds want them to? Yes. Will they? There's been no evidence to this point, but we've we got a long way to go in a federal probe and in the in the in the ramping up to this uh, this trial. Anything can happen anytime. And certainly Andrews has been loyal up until this point. That might be a bit more difficult, but obviously we don't know what sort of deals either will be offered. When we were covering the arraignment earlier this week, neither spoke to the media, and that's largely going to likely be, much as it's a disappointment to us and the public that wants to know what's going on, probably a smart legal, legal strategy. All right, both of you said here as we heard from our legislative leaders. Carol Marine, are you buying the positive vibes coming out of both parties after this session? Well, you know, they're positive enough because they they're actually are relieved that they got something done with a minimum of blood on the floor. What I was stunned by is neither one of them really knew what was in the bill that got and passed. And these are the people that are negotiating these bills. These are the leaders in the legislature. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm somebody at home going, you didn't read the bill, you didn't know what was in the bill, and you've got to go back to the sponsor to figure it out. It's too late. Amanda Vinicky, what do you think people are going to discover hidden deep in the depths of these bills that might surprise them? Ooh, I, I, I wish I knew. I, we, we don't know because there will be surprises. And as both of the leaders spoke to, sometimes that's sheer mistakes, but perhaps that speaks to the problem of passing these bills in such short order. Certainly they are discussed for weeks on end, but the public, we reporters, I mean, covering it was kind of crazy because things moved very quickly. You had aspects taken out, added in, a racetrack. Where was it going to go? Ends up in the south suburb somewhere. We don't know a whole lot of what is in these measures. Um, I also do want to add in terms of this positive vibe, I, I think that there certainly really is relief after what were some painful years in state government. Everybody is glad in Springfield to be over that. Nonetheless, I, 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 to a degree, Republicans didn't have all that much of a choice. They had to get in there and negotiate whatever they could. We have to constantly remember that they are in the super, super minority this in both was chambers. In, this was in their interest to go along with Pritzker as well. They got a balanced budget. They can complain about the uh, the constitutional amendment. They're going to have photo ops in their districts with shovels and projects sure, and right, road right, repairs. And they got some of what businesses have been really wanting for a long time, including that they were frustrated they did not get under C the Rauner Carol, administration. Carol, I want to pose a question to you that I oppose to them. Is Illinois going down a dark path with all this gambling and all this marijuana? We don't know, but but it's a really serious question. And, and gaming, the Gaming Commission, first of all, is, is hard pressed to enforce what is currently on the books. To be able to, to oversee video poker and all of the other gaming positions, this is gonna be a tough one. And where there can be corruption, there will be corruption, and how they're gonna keep, uh, keep control of it, I think is a tricky thing. We're gonna have to watch that. Carol Marine, Amanda Vinicky, thank you as always. And speaking of one of the subjects we talked about, marijuana. It may be legal in a handful of states, but it's still Ill illegal when it comes to federal law. That makes for a messy business when it comes to how, when, and with whom legal marijuana businesses can bank. Five local PBS stations around the country, including here at WTTW, are examining marijuana in their communities. In the final installment of our series, Arizona PBS producer Alisa Adams found that in Arizona, where medical marijuana is legal, Businesses are struggling to figure out how to handle the money.
Yeah, so these are 15 milligrams a piece. The medical marijuana business is good. So the CBD farm caps are going to be 10 a piece. Very good. Milligrams. Sitting at $63. Right? By some industry estimates, legal marijuana businesses made over $10 billion in sales in 2018. That's a lot of cash with nowhere to go. Okay. I love it. I enjoy it. It doesn't feel like work. Marie Saloum got into the medical marijuana business to ensure quality marijuana medication for her husband, who's a patient. And while together they successfully tackled the ins and outs of growing, literally, a highly regulated business, dealing with banks almost had her beat. At the beginning, I had probably had to open every week a bank account because I already knew that the one that I opened maybe two weeks before that, I was about to get a letter, I already knew it, They're telling me you have this X amount of days before, you know, we kick you out. The cat and mouse game with banks meant she had to find creative ways to pay bills, pay her employees, fund investments, because the truth is, even nine years after medical marijuana first became legal in Arizona, before cash is years. still king in most Arizona medical dispensaries. We have to pay a lot of people in cash, which can be very challenging. We have to have security, armed security at all times, uh, get cashier's checks or money orders to pay, like just utilities. Sarah Stalker is the regional manager of Nirvana Center Dispensaries. She spends a lot of extra time and energy trying to do what most businesses with a bank account do easily, like pay taxes. We have to pay those in cash. It can be scary. And the dispensaries aren't the only ones nervous about working with this cash. Fear is likely a big reason only an estimated one in 30 banks nationwide openly accepts cannabis customers. The revenue derived from it is considered um, revenue derived from money laundering. Paul Hickman is the president and CEO of the Arizona Bankers Association, a trade group for commercial banks. He says many banks actually would like to do business with legal marijuana companies. Bankers are really good pillars of their community, and they like to build their communities, and they like to make sure that there's, that, that you know, legal businesses have a legal outlet to do their, their financial affairs and their banking. None of the dozen banks we reached out to would talk on camera. At least one of the two banks in the state that works with cannabis told us over the phone they believe the community is safer if all this cash is able to be banked, making it traceable and more transparent. They also said they originally got into the cannabis banking business because they believed it would become legal at the federal level any day. That hasn't happened. Mixed messages from the federal government makes banks wary. In 2013, the Obama administration signed the Cole Memorandum, which essentially said as long as businesses followed state laws, the feds would leave them alone. Then in 2018, the Trump administration rescinded the Cole Memo, leaving banks to wonder if they were vulnerable again to federal scrutiny. At first blush, most of the bankers in Arizona aren't any different from most of the banking sector around the country where they're like, no, I don't want to take on that sort of risk. It's a reputational issue still. Um, it require, it's, it's expensive in terms to set up a system to do it. In order to work with marijuana businesses, banks have to file a suspicious activity report on every account every three months. And with thousands of accounts, that is a lot of paperwork. But it's this kind of regulation that has actually created opportunities for other businesses. When you're banking a highly regulated industry, there's such a massive regulatory compliance burden, and it's so easy for things to fall through the cracks, so to speak. Tyler Berlin yeah. is an executive with Hyper, a company that essentially offers banks and credit unions a more efficient way of working with cannabis companies. For a fee, they take care of everything from compliance to monitoring and paperwork. They also offer customers a non-cash way to pay for their medication. It allows for a consumer to download an app. Uh, they can set up a quick profile. They can link their checking account to their profile. They can walk into a dispensary. They can check in via phone. Nirvana Center Dispensaries uses a different digital platform that also specializes in highly regulated industries. Awesome. But manager Sarah Stalker says the system doesn't work as seamlessly as, say, a credit or debit card. They can get double charged sometimes. We have to refund money. It's, it can be frustrating. Marie Saloum did finally find a bank willing to work with her. And things have gotten easier, but she pays a premium for that ease. They know they got you, so um, they charge me outrageous fees, you know. 
um, compared to other businesses. Still, the legal cannabis industry continues to grow. With the discount today, um, it looks like you are at 54.68. Raking in cash that goes back into the economy with or without the banks. There you go. Right on, dude. Thank you. Yeah, have a great day. For Arizona PBS, I'm Elisa Adams. Recently, the attorneys general from 38 states signed a letter to Congress urging them to pass the Safe Banking Act or any other legislation that would expand banking access for cannabis companies. You can see all of the marijuana stories from this series on our website. And that's our show for this Wednesday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Will Alderman go along with Mayor Lightfoot's new ethics proposals? We'll ask some of them. And an acclaimed photographer looks back at pictures he took in Chicago 70 years ago. We leave you tonight with a Blues Fest rehearsal at Chicago's Delmark Studios from earlier today. And for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. I thank you for watching. Good evening. Captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.